Quite a few years ago, I was driving through uh, the bush in Africa. We were in uh, kind of central Mali at the time. And as we were driving through and four-wheel drive in the, in the vehicle heading, trying to find the next village that we were going to go to, we had set our sights on a village called Jenny. And uh, Jenny was known to be a kind of spiritually dark village. And I had an African uh, brother, a believer, an evangelist that was with me. And we're going through the bush and we're heading towards Jenny, going to stop in some other villages if we could find some along the way. And as we're going, I said, man, tell, tell, tell me some stories. Tell me some stories about, about Jenny since you, you know about this village. And he said, well, a lot of people don't like to go there. And I said, well, well why? He said, well, there's a lot of kind of dark magic. There's a lot of evil that goes on there. And I said, come on, what kind of evil? Let me, let me, let me hear some things, you know. I, I've, I've seen a little bit in my day. Why don't, you, why don't you tell me something? He goes, all right. He said, well, a few years ago, there was a, a group of people that had gone to Jenny, and their hope was uh, to just kind of do some exploration about the, the town, um, learn about some of the ancient mosques there and things of that nature. And you have to realize that in, in Mali, the, the religion, the predominant religion is Islam, uh, but it's syncretistic, which means that for their salvation, they would follow the things of Islam. But for their day-to-day -day life, it would be animism. It would be uh, kind of like similar with Native Americans and African tribal religions is what it would be. And so he said this group went there and they arrived. And after the first night, pretty much everybody in the group got sick and one person even died and they got out of there. And I said, well, ooh, what happened? He said, well, they put a spell on him. Who put a spell? The witch doctors in the village. And I was like, well, I'm not so sure about that. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, now there's been another trip a few years later where some Christians did go up to this village and they tried to do some evangelism. They were trying to get in there. And I said, well, tell me about that trip. He said, well, that one was actually quite different. They arrived, next day they woke up, everyone was fine. Second day, second night, everyone slept, got up the next day and everyone was fine. So it was on that next day that a witch doctor came to the group and he came to them and said, I want to know what power you have. W what do you mean? Well, he said, I've been putting hexes on you for the last two nights and nothing has happened. And I want to know about the power you have. Now make no mistake, he was not interested in Jesus. He was interested in power. Now, why do I share that story with you? Well, it's a story of spiritual warfare. And as we look at Daniel chapter 10 today, we're going to see some insights into spiritual warfare. And my hope is that as we look through the chapter and see many things in the passage, my hope is that God would open our eyes to what is going on around us. He would unveil our eyes. You remember, as we've talked about apocalyptic literature, part of what it does is it peels back for us the, the physical things that we see and shows us the spiritual realm. And that's something that we're going to see today in the text. So, Open again, if you're not there, to Daniel chapter 10, and let's look through the passage today. For those who have not been with us before, we've been going through the book of Daniel, but we did take a small pause for Palm Sunday and Easter, and last week, our brother Luke coming and preaching the word to us out of uh, Corinthians. So let me quickly remind you where we've been in the book of Daniel. Daniel, of course, written many, many years ago by the prophet Daniel. Daniel had been taken away during the Babylonian captivity. Him and many other of the Jews were taken in to Babylon. And as we've gone through the book of Daniel, we've seen God's faithfulness to Daniel. We've seen a bunch of visions that would tell us of how all the big world events are going to play out. We've even seen that there were going to be kingdoms that would come. There would be the Babylonians, followed by the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans, and we've seen that they were coming, these different kingdoms, but we also know that God is sovereign over all of these things, and we know that it is God who lifts up nations and puts down nations. Nobody does anything without God's permission. He is sovereign over all. That does not mean that they're not choices that need to be made, and certainly sins that we commit and that others commit as well. We saw, of course, in Daniel 7, where we saw the 
one like a son of man who would get his kingdom. He would do all that he had been told by the Father and purchase us with his death and resurrection. We saw in Daniel 8 another vision that was, again, challenging for us, but we worked through it. And then Daniel chapter 9 was the prayer that we took about three weeks to go through. Daniel chapter 9 was talking about Daniel's prayer because the 70 years of exile was coming to an end. And Daniel was asking that God would bless them and allow them to return to their land and that they would be able to rebuild the temple and worship him rightly. And we saw that Gabriel brought an answer, but the answer wasn't exactly what Daniel was looking for. He thought that there would be just a, a, an ability to return and everything would go great. And Gabriel said, actually, there's going to be more challenges for God's people, but don't worry, there's one who is coming at the end of the 70 weeks. That is Christ, who would come and bring in everlasting righteousness and anoint the most holy place. He would put an end to sin. He would finish the transgression. He would atone for iniquity and seal both vision and profit. And we talked about how that was Christ. So when we ended, I presented to you different interpretations of the 70 weeks and where I fell on that. And that takes us up to chapter 10. What you need to know at chapter 10 is that God's people have been released. They've been in Babylon and those 70 years have ended. And if you look on your notes on the first page in Ezra chapter 1, Ezra chapter 1, let me read this to you. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. The Babylonians were gone. Now the new king, Cyrus, is in place. So that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and, rebu and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. In short, what happened was this pagan king now is ruling and God says, now's the time and he works in this pagan king's heart and says you need to tell my people it's time to go back to build my house again the lord is sovereign over the nations so the people were to go back millions upon millions of jews were going to be excited to go back to the promised land and worship the lord rebuild the temple but that's not what happened only 50,000 went back. They became comfortable in Babylon. They became comfortable among the Persians. They had assimilated in and no longer cared that much about the Holy Land and the temple. Friends, before we get into the text, just take that as a warning. If you are not careful, you will find yourself so comfortable in Babylon that you don't even long to go home anymore. If you're a follower of Jesus and death absolutely terrifies you and you look deeply into that, it's because you don't want to leave this place, then you might be too close to Babylon. This is not our home. We do not belong here. And if you are holding too tightly to this place, you may be like the Jews of that time who wanted to stay in Babylon. Only 50,000 had returned and they got back, but within the first year, they were getting opposition from people who were there. We read about this in Ezra chapter 4. They were trying to rebuild, and it was stopped. And that takes us to the setting of Daniel chapter 10 today. Let's read through the text. Daniel chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict, or great conflict in it. And he understood the word, and he understood and had understanding of the vision. 
Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold of Uphaz around his waist. His body was like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like a sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone. And I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Verse 15. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and he spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by reason of the vision pains have come upon me. And I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me. No breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh, man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. This last section of the book of Daniel, chapters 10, 11, and 12, are actually one section. This is kind of setting the framework for the vision that we're going to read about in chapters 11 and 12 next week. So what I hope to do is as we work through this passage today, pull out a few things that might be helpful for us today as we see this interaction. Back to verse 1. Daniel says this, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which would be probably 535, 538 BC, a word was revealed to Daniel. Now, Daniel's going to have a word from the Lord. But notice, this hasn't happened for quite a few chapters. He's named Belteshazzar. Remember, he, he was referred to that back all the way back in chapter 5. Why does the author put this here? I think it's to remind us of Daniel's time back with the Babylonians. He's been there now. Seven decades. He's been there. The other people have gone back. And they're facing opposition, but Daniel is still here. He's still in Babylon, or right now he's just outside at the river. It's possible that he was too old to make the trip back. He's been praying that this would happen, that they would return, but he has not returned. The best that we know is that Daniel spent his whole time in exile from the age 15 onward and was found faithful. Notice what it says, and the word was true, and there was great conflict. So the word that's going to be described to us, especially in chapters 11 and 12, it's true, and there's great conflict in it. 
But notice that he understood this one. There were other visions that Daniel's like, I don't really understand what happened. This one he understands. I think this is tied back to what he was praying before in chapter 9. It seems that he wants more details. He would like to know more of what is going on. Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. It says in those days and weeks, these are days of weeks, kind of like we saw in the previous chapter, days of years. This is apocalyptic literature. It does this. But here's what happens is he's fasting. And I want to take just a moment and talk about fasting for a minute. Because many of us do not use the discipline of fasting very well. Some of us like to think we are fasting, but we find out after about a day into it, it's like, ah, oh, that was tough. There are, there's such a, a fasting where you might see where some will fast from food and drink for 40 days like Jesus or Moses. But that's not all the type of fasting. It may be that you do it for a shorter period of time. It may be that you do food and drink. It may be like you do like Daniel's done where it's no delicacies, no meat, no wine, nothing that is kind of extra or good, if you will. Fasting can look a lot of different ways, but what's the purpose of it? Well, I would say that the, the purpose of, a, of us fasting is to get away from distractions. How many of you would say that your walk with the Lord could be better if you weren't so distracted? Yeah. Part of what fasting does, whether it's from food or drink or delicacies or the internet or your phone or something else, is to help us get focused on God, to be able to hear from God, to understand more of who God is, to understand what's going on in our lives. We need to slow our minds down. We need to focus on the Lord and depend on Him and realize that our dependence is not on food of this earth, but on the Word of God. We need God, and fasting will help us refocus and hear from Him. Specifically through His Word, of course, we have the Spirit of God inside of us, and He uses the Word to teach us, to guide us. In addition, with Daniel in particular, it seems that he's fasting so he could understand better, hear more from God, but it seems that he also wants to identify with his brothers and sisters who are suffering in Jerusalem. They've gone back to rebuild 50,000 of them and they've already hit a snag and they cannot build and they're facing persecution. And Daniel was hoping that they would be able to build. He's identifying with them. So when he goes without, he's better able to understand and identify with God's people who are suffering. So another reason that maybe we should try fasting and going without is to identify with our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering. Say, what is it like to, 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 to not have food? What is it not like to not have air conditioning? What is it like to not have these different things that are not bad in themselves? But when we don't even think about our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering, maybe it would be good for us to be intentional so that way we could pray for them. Because I believe something like when one of us suffers, we all suffer. Is that true of you? Is that true of other Christians in this church when other brothers and sisters are suffering? Do you even know? Do you pay attention to the prayer updates? Do you even know what's going on in each other's lives? You have to focus and be intentional to know what's going on. And when they're suffering, we should be suffering. When they're rejoicing, what should we be doing? Rejoicing. We need to get our head out of the sand and see what's going on around us and around the world. And it may be good for us to fast. But always mixed with this fasting is prayer. Because here's what happens. You begin to hurt if you've ever done it. Your stomach begins to hurt and you're going, oh. And at that moment, you know, Lord, I want to hear from you. And there's usually a lot of silence and a lot of solitude, which again, we need this to be able to think about God. For those of you who have found a significant other at some point in your life, you've been married perhaps and you found somebody, when you first started dating that person in particular, you would think about that person all the time. Some of you ladies, I know what you did. You got your notebooks and you would write your name and you put his last name. <laughs> did some, some of y'all did, I know you did. You wrote your name with his last name and you kind of made it cursive with hearts. It was beautiful. Think about the people that you love. In particular, perhaps your spouse, but 
others that you love, you spend time thinking about them. What are they doing? What's going on? I want to learn more about you. Do you realize that it should be the same with God? We should spend time thinking about God. Like sitting there and the things that you've heard preached or the things that you read, sitting there, not just, okay, read my quiet time. Okay, good. Now on to the next thing. No, actually stopping and just thinking about God. One of the great disciplines that we have lost as the Western church in particular is the idea to be able to meditate, not in the Eastern way, but meditate on the Lord, meditate on his law, think about the scriptures, slow down. Brothers and sisters, we are going too fast, even here on the island. People come here and they're like, wow, life is so slow and they can't even adjust sometimes. We're still going too fast here. We need to take time with the Lord and that includes fasting. So it's going to be distancing ourselves from things that would be temptations to us that we would enjoy, but it's going to help us focus in and be able to identify with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Daniel's been doing this, and he's eaten no delicacies or meat. Now this goes all the way back to chapter 1. Remember that part of what he did in the beginning when he was uh, brought to Nebuchadnezzar, they offered him these different foods, and he said, no, 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 we're only going to eat vegetables. Well, it wasn't that he was against eating meat altogether. It was at that time he was not able to do that because of his conscience. Now, apparently, Daniel's been able to do that, but he's going to voluntarily step away from those things so he can hear from the Lord and identify with his brothers and sisters. Verse 4, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold and uphaz around his waist. As I'm reading through this, some of you, your minds are going to probably go to Revelation chapter 1 as it describes Christ very similarly. His body was like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning. What does that look like? I can't even imagine that. His eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Now let me say quickly here, there's debate among theologians of who this is. You got three options, okay? Option one, that this is Christ before he took on human flesh and came. So we'd say Christophany. It's where Christ appears in the Old Testament before his coming. Some would say this is Christ. Could be. Some would say this is Gabriel, who's been coming and talking with him already. So the angel Gabriel. Or the third option would be another angel, perhaps. We don't know exactly. The text is not extremely clear. Some say, well, that sounds a lot like Revelation. I'm going to vote Jesus. Okay, vote Jesus. Vote, vote Christ. The only problem is, later on in the text, if it's talking about the same person later on, he's not able to defeat the prince of Persia, and Michael has to come help him. That doesn't feel like Jesus. So another option, as you go through, is that there are actually two different people that are in this. One is Christ, and then the hands that touch him would be an angel. And then that speaks about the, about, uh, the prince of Persia. And then back to Christ again, perhaps. It could be that. We honestly, we just don't know. But here's what we do know. This is represent, re representing God. Whoever's coming, angel as a messenger of God, Christ, it's representing God. And that's what we need to interact with, okay? So, and I, Daniel, verse 7, alone saw the vision. Daniel had other people with him, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. They couldn't even see what was going on, but the holiness that was happening there, they just fled. That might remind you of Paul's experience, Saul, when he became Paul. There's some similarities there when he was talking to Christ. So again, another argument possibly for Christ there. So I was, listen to this, this is very important, verse 8. So I was left alone. He's alone, or he feels alone. And he saw this great vision, and look what happens. This great vision is so glorious and holy, and he feels alone, and it's awe-inspiring that no strength was left in him. And he says his radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and he retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Can you picture it? Just overwhelmed with the awesomeness of this one, this vision that he's seeing. But notice what happens. When he's overwhelmed, when he's face down, he's even asleep, he can't handle it. Here's what God does through the messenger, through Christ, whatever. This is what God does. And behold, a hand touched me. 
and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He's shaking. He's on his hands and knees now. And he said to me, oh, Daniel, listen what he says. He said this once before. He's scared. He's overwhelmed. He has no strength. The hand touches him. He starts to get a little bit of strength. And here's what the first thing he hears. Oh, Daniel, man, greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I now have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And this one, Christ or Gabriel, whatever, verse 12, then he said to me, fear not. He can see, he's trembling. Fear not, it's okay. Side note here, if this is an angel, this is a common occurrence in scripture. Fear not. Do not buy toilet paper that has baby angels on it. I don't have stock or anything against it, but listen. Angels are not little babies with wings. Anywhere in scripture. Likewise, listen carefully to me. When our loved ones pass, they don't become angels. We actually, as believers in Christ, will sit in judgment over angels. See, angels long to look into what we have. There's one thing that they don't understand. There's one. Now they have seen God in his presence and they come and they're actually in here now, according to what Paul writes in Corinthians, around us. And there's one thing that they do not understand and it's redemption. They do not understand salvation. A third of them fell and they are evil demons with Satan and there was no chance of redemption for them. No dying on the cross for them. And then there's us, made from the dirt, who spit on our Lord in rebellion against him from day one. If you don't believe me, go serve in the nursery. (laughs) I was in there last week, reminded me, oh Lord, we're evil (laughs) from birth. Made from the dirt. And God says, you're greatly loved. I'll send my son to die for you. I'll send my son to rise for you. I'll send my son to do all that you couldn't do. And it was part of the plan from the beginning. You don't want to turn into an angel, I promise you that. You want to be a follower of Christ, adopted into his family, and redeemed forever, and to sit in the heavenly places with Christ. That's just a side note. That's free. Verse 11 again, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. What an amazing statement. Before we saw Daniel's prayer, and he prayed, and before he even finished praying, what happened? Anyone remember what happened? An angel was there. Gabriel was there before he even finished praying. This time, he's praying, and how long is it we have to wait? 21 days. Before the answer comes. Now, it's not that it wasn't heard immediately. It was heard. He says, from the moment you did that, you humbled yourselves, and you prayed And your words have been heard by God. And I have come because of your words. If you don't think prayer makes a difference, read that verse. Why did he come? Because of your words. In a strange mystery, in the sovereignty of God, on the other side of that coin is the providence of God, where he works out his plan. And in that, we have choices to make. And in that mystery, when we pray, the hand of God moves. And we are prayerless people. We're a prayerless people. And we believe that God's hand would move. I've come because of your words. They've been heard. But he's going to explain what happened. Verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. What? What does that look like? I have no idea what that looks like, just so you know. Studying the Bible now for over 20 years, I have no idea what that looks like. All I know is that this one was coming 
dispatched. And the prince of Persia was withstanding him, battling him. Now God, for a moment, God could have just said, do this, right? He's able to do that. Is he not? Yes? Yeah? Okay. But in the, if you will, the rules of the game of how he's made things on this earth, things are still going towards his ultimate plan, but there's stuff that happens. There's real spiritual warfare. And he's on his knees praying and fasting and asking God, and the answer's not coming. 21 days later, he comes and he goes, hey, just so you know, man greatly loved, you've been heard from the beginning. But the prince of Persia was fighting me. Oh, I didn't know the prince of Persia could do that. There is a battle happening all around. We don't even see it. We see the outworkings, and a lot of times what we see in the physical realm is coming from that, but it is going on all around us. Guys, it is going all around your families. It is going all around this church, your homes. Satan is one who's described as a lion looking to devour. So I've talked about this with you before. Think about for a moment when you look at your children and your grandchildren, your spouses, and you're thinking, oh, I'm a little upset with them or I'm too busy to pray for them, think about a gigantic lion behind them about to maul them and destroy them. Might get you to pray. Because spiritually, that's what's happening all around. That's what this is showing us. So this one is fighting the prince of Persia. Then he goes, ah, but after that time, Michael comes along, one of the chief princes, and he came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the later days, for the vision is of the days yet to come. He says, Michael finally came. We overtook this guy, so now I'm here and I can answer your prayer. Remarkable. We can't understand all of it. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one with the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Look at that again. He's explaining. He finds out more things. It's overwhelming. Where does he go? Straight back down. Does God leave him there? No. No. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of vision and pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. I'm empty. I'm empty, God. You ever been there? That's not a bad place to be. In fact, I'd submit to you that's a great place to be. God, I'm empty. I need your strength. Because our strength, true strength, comes from the Lord. For now, no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. It's hard to be proud if you're in that situation. Do you know God will take you there to show you your pride? Do you know that he'll take you there so you can rely on him and not yourself? And look what happens, verse 18. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, look what he says again because we're quick to forget, especially when things are going difficult and we're just empty, what we need to hear, oh man, greatly loved. Don't be afraid, loved ones. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. Not because you're awesome, but because your God is awesome. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened. You see that? As the word comes from God, your strength comes. And yet we neglect our reading of the scriptures. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. He's got to go back and fight more. But look what it says here. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. This seems to be one specific demon, if you will, that was over the, the Persian empire. I told this to you, uh, this to you before. Another one over the Greek empire. Another one over the Roman Empire. And what's interesting, watch how it ends here. But I tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth, there is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Michael seems to be directly connected to the Jewish people. This is the setting up of the vision that we'll get into next week. Here's a few things I have for you to take away. At the end of your notes, five things. Number one, we need to realize we are in a real spiritual battle all the time. No days off. They are not getting tired. They're not getting hungry in that sense. They are coming after you all the time. And just so you know, we want to put on the armor of God. I have Ephesians 6 in here for you. It doesn't say go ahead and take it off either. Leave it on. <laughs> it will come off because of our flesh, but you've got to put it back on by the Spirit. 
Number two, we must use the weapons the Lord has given us to fight the spiritual battles we face. Prayer, meditation, of course, on his word, fasting, and the word of God. If you have never used those things, if you're not serious about those things, let me encourage you, ask for God to help you and get serious. We need to be serious people. There's a serious war happening and people's souls are on the line. And your holiness, the Lord has won the battle. Amen? Amen. But if it were over like that, you guys wouldn't be here and neither would I. So we have work left to do. Your strength and help comes from the Lord like we saw with Daniel over and over again. Your strength comes this, from the spirit given to you in the word of God. And lastly, you are greatly loved by God. And one thing that Daniel said, he said, they left me and I was alone. Those other guys went away. He said he was alone. Guess what? You're never alone. Jesus himself says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We are not alone. But friends, we can learn from this passage in Daniel and continue to cry out to our Christ, the one that would love us enough to live for us, die for us, and rise for us. We got work to do. The battle's real. Let's stop messing around and get serious. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we're, we're thankful that God, you, you actually answered our prayers today as we started off with even some distractions on the day we're talking about spiritual warfare. And Brother Jamie asked that you would help us to stay focused. And God, you graciously answered that. Help us to stay focused as we leave this place. Help us to encourage one another, to remind one another that we are in a war. And Lord, Help us to, by your spirit, with the, the things you've given us, fight like it depends on us, even though we know it does not depend on us, but depends on you, Christ. Help us to, to rest at night, as Charles Spurgeon would say, like the, we're going to fight during the day like the ba battle depends on us, and we're going to lay our heads on our pillows, knowing that the battle depends on Christ. Both are true. But we need your spirit to do it. Help us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.